Okay, so y'all, it is time for a deep dive. And the way I wanna start this is to say, imagine for a second that you or someone you know has to have surgery. And the doctor, they do everything right, right? They follow the latest guidance, but still, somehow something goes wrong. And then, maybe a few years later, you find out that guidance, it was wrong. And in fact, that guidance was based on research that's now not only been debunked, but also should have never been published in the first place. And unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that that might just be happening more than you think. And that's because scientific misconduct from just carelessness to outright fraud it happens way more than most people realize. In fact, it's not only tolerated, it is arguably incentivized by the nature of academic publishing today. And the wrongdoers, they're rarely held accountable. And so to just dive in, let me start the whole thing by telling you about Don, Poldermans. He was a medical researcher at Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands. He spent years analyzing the risk of complications during cardiovascular surgery, publishing hundreds of papers, accumulating thousands of citations, and making a name for himself as one of the most influential researchers in the field. And he was especially well known for his work on what are known as beta blockers, or they're the type of medicine that limits the effects of certain hormones in the body in order to slow down someone's heartbeat and lower their blood pressure. With Poldermans publishing dozens of papers on that topic alone, with one of the big questions he looked into being basically whether it'd be a good idea to give patients a beta blocker before certain surgeries. And his research, it said yes. So not long after, European medical guidelines and to a lesser extent, American guidelines recommended the practice. But then the problem? Polderman's data was fudged. Or at least in 2011, that medical center fired Polderman's for scientific misconduct. With him then saying in a statement that research carried out under his leadership was not always performed in accordance with current scientific standards. With him specifically claiming that in his influential beta blocker study, quote, it was found that he used patient data without written permission, used fictitious data, and that two reports were submitted to conferences which included knowingly unreliable data. And then finally there, it said that, quote, there were no medical implications for the patients who took part in the studies. But here's the thing, while that may be true, there were almost certainly medical implications for patients who didn't take part in the studies. Right? In 2014, a new meta-analysis came out evaluating whether to use beta blockers before non-cardiac surgery. And it found that beta blockers made it 27% more likely that someone would die within 30 days of their surgery. Or in other words, the policy Poldermans had recommended on the basis of falsified data and that had been subsequently adopted by the European medical establishment was actually dramatically increasing the chances of people dying. And in fact, in 2014, two of the people behind the meta-analysis estimated that there may have been as many as 800,000 extra deaths that could have been otherwise avoided. Which also, to be clear here, that is a rough estimate, and that number is still hotly debated. But then also going beyond that, Holderman's, while accepting that mistakes were made, has denied that he intentionally faked any data. But intentional or not, there is no doubt that if you are faking medical research, you're playing with people's lives. And there, I mean, just to give an example that everyone can relate to, let's talk about COVID-19. Right, in 2020, near the start of the pandemic, there was a paper published in The Lancet, which if you don't know, I mean, that's one of the most prestigious and well-regarded scientific journals in the world. And the study that it published, it claimed to have looked at more than 96,000 coronavirus patients across the world. And after controlling for AIDS, Age, sex, and how sick the subjects were, they found that patients receiving hydroxychloroquine or something similar were about twice as likely to die as those who didn't. What we saw is within days, the World Health Organization suspending its study of the drug due to safety concerns. But at the same time, people looking closely at the study began seeing problems. But I mean, for one, the study reported more COVID-19 deaths of enrolled patients in the Australia portion than there were COVID-19 deaths in the entire country. And then the hospital supposedly enrolled in the study revealed they had never heard of the company that conducted it. Right? And so the paper was quickly retracted and luckily hydroxychloroquine is not in fact an effective COVID-19 treatment. So as far as like these sorts of things go that we're talking about, no harm done. But of course, that is not always the case. Right? More than one bogus study helped perpetuate the myth that ivermectin was some sort of COVID-19 miracle drug, with it then actually becoming a focal point of the anti-vaxxer vaccine hesitant movement. But despite everything that we're talking about, holding people accountable is often impossible. Right? If you are a surgeon and a patient dies on your table and there's evidence of malpractice, you can bet your ass there's gonna be lawsuits. I mean, fuck, you might even face criminal charges. But if you conduct research on surgery and a patient dies on the table of a surgeon following your advice and there is evidence of misconduct or fraud, it might get fired. I mean, Poldermans, he lost his job, but most of his papers weren't even retracted and he's faced no further consequences. And that is in no way unusual. I mean, take it from Elizabeth Bick. She studies scientific fraud and has personally discovered dozens of cases of altered images in medical journals. And she says, it's very rare that people lose jobs over it. With her even telling Vox, if the most serious consequence for speeding was a police officer saying, don't do that again, everyone would be speeding. You know, with that, I should say that these cases that we've talked about so far, they are of course just a fraction of the overall problem. I mean, in 2023, the number of papers retracted by scientific research journals topped 10,000 for the first time. Now, of course, with that, some of that is due to increased awareness of the issue here, new tools for detecting fraud, as well as there being a growing army of volunteer sleuths who analyze academic literature for anomalies. But even with that said, Ivan Oransky and Adam Marcus, who founded a group called Retraction Watch, they say that the number of retractions is almost definitely a vast undercount of 
of how much misconduct and fraud exists. With them estimating, there should be at least 100,000 retractions every year. And some think that it should be even higher. And a lot of that here has to do with what's known as paper mills. Right? These are sketchy companies that sell entire papers, authorship slots, or citations to a researcher's work to make it seem more important. And a big thing is that in some cases, journal editors have been bribed to accept articles, and paper mills have also managed to plant their own agents on editorial boards who then allow falsified work to be published. In fact, one investigation identified several paper mills and more than 30 editors of reputable journals who appear to have been involved in this type of activity. And I mean, just last May, major scientific publisher Wiley basically had no choice but to shut down 19 scientific journals after retracting more than 11,000 sham papers. So understandably, people are worried that all this fraud is going to have a domino effect. Right? I mean, you have people like Dorothy Bishop of Oxford University saying, in many fields, it is becoming difficult to build up a cumulative approach to a subject because we lack a solid foundation of trustworthy findings. And it's getting worse and worse. Add it. People are building careers on the back of this tidal wave of fraudulent science and could end up running scientific institutes and eventually be used by mainstream journals as reviewers and editors. And then you also have folks like Malcolm McLeod of Edinburgh University saying, scientific knowledge is being polluted by made up material. We are facing a crisis. But then also with all of this, you have Oransky, right? One of the guys who co-founded Retraction Watch. He says that paper mills are not the problem, but a symptom of the actual problem. But I'm going on to say the problems in scientific literature are long standing and they're an incentive problem. And the metrics that people use to measure research feed a business model, a ravenous sort of insatiable business model. And there, people like him point to the fact that university rankings rely heavily on the number of citations gained by work produced by the institution's researchers. Right? When universities move up the rankings, the more top tier students and faculty they attract along with more funding. And of course, with this, the journals are making money too. Right? Authors and universities, they pay journals anywhere from hundreds of dollars to more than $10,000 to publish their papers and make them available without a subscription. And with that, researchers are often required either explicitly or by implication to publish papers in order to earn and keep jobs or to be promoted. Right, as explained by Marcus Manafo of Bristol University, if you have growing numbers of researchers who are being strongly incentivized to publish just for the sake of publishing, while we have a growing number of journals making money from publishing the resulting articles, you have a perfect storm. And so with all this, forgetting trying to reform the whole system, even trying to hold individual wrongdoers accountable, it faces major obstacles. Right, because they fight back. I mean, in one shocking case from back in 2006, a Bangladeshi researcher had his colleague murdered when he discovered the researcher's academic fraud. And that researcher, along with his accomplice, was hung last year. Though of course, that is an extreme example. More often, what we see are scientists accused of faking it, filing frivolous lawsuits against the people who point it out. And so that ends up making it so that people are afraid to speak out. Take, for example, Francesca Gino, a Harvard Business School professor famous for her research on the subject of uh, dishonesty. Kind of perfect for the story today. Right, and in 2023, questions about her work surfaced in an article appearing on the Chronicle of Higher Education. Within not long after, a blog run by three behavioral scientists publishing a four-part series finding evidence of fraud in four academic papers co-authored by Gino. Right, and so she was placed on administrative leave. But last year, Harvard Business School released a report finding her responsible for the alleged misconduct and recommending that she be fired. Though notably, throughout all this, Gino maintained her innocence. And in fact, she filed a defamation lawsuit against both Harvard and the bloggers who first published the allegations. And that's an issue, right? because Gino doesn't have have to win her lawsuit for it to have an impact. As outlets like Vox explained, she doesn't need to propose a credible theory of how the data manipulation could have happened without her involvement. In the words of defamation lawyer Ken White, the process is the punishment. And with that, people like C.K. Gonzalez, an expert in research ethics, says that institutions often just stop investigating someone after they leave, which means potential future employers are totally unaware of the person's history of allegations. Notably, she said one of the main reasons why is that the institution is afraid a researcher will sue them for defamation if anything leaks out. Though, of course, with that said, you know, we have people that say you have have to give people the benefit of the doubt, right? Because honest mistakes do happen. And in some cases, it is very hard to distinguish misconduct from someone just fucking up. I mean, for example, last January, a molecular biologist by the name of Sholto David uncovered evidence of widespread data manipulation in various cancer studies. And notably, this included leading researchers at the Harvard-affiliated Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And among them is the Institute's CEO and COO. With that then leading to the retraction of six papers in an investigation with the Institute's Research Integrity Officer, Barrett J. Rollins, saying, the presence of image discrepancies in a paper is not evidence evidence of an author's intent to deceive. And that's true, right? Like I said, mistakes happen. But you also have people like David also saying, the expectation is that scientists who do this research have high standards and are very careful in what they do. And asking how many errors are acceptable before we think something more worrying is happening. And so of course, with that whole incentive structure that we talked about before, some people argue that mistakes are more likely. Or because even if someone doesn't outright commit fraud, they might rush things or cut corners to get publishable results. Which I mean, speaking of that cancer research in 2021, a $2 million eight year attempt to replicate influential cancer research papers ended with the realization that fewer than half of the experiments could actually be reproduced. But then all of that, of course, brings us to the question of what should be done. I mean, for the more extreme cases with clear-cut case
cases of intentional fraud, right? You have people talking about criminalizing, right? They say a new statute narrowly tailored to scientific fakery could make it clearer where to draw the line between carelessness and fraud. But of course that has problems too, right? In complex cases like these, courts can take years to deliver justice. Because in any case, most judges and juries aren't well equipped to analyze the data themselves. So besides that, people like the founders of Retraction Watch have offered other recommendations for how this could be handled outside of the courtroom, right? One thing would be to give government agencies such as the Office of Research Integrity more teeth and better funding. Another would be to stop relying so much on citations as a metric of quality. Finally, they say scientific journals get rid of the so-called pay for play business model that quote, by charging researchers to publish their work has the effect of putting the veneer of legitimacy up for sale. But you know, with all that, whether you are in or out of the, the world of research, in or out of the world of academia, I'd love to know your thoughts here. So if you did leave a comment, I'd love to know if you do or do not have a background in this. But the final thing I wanna say here is like, this is not all to say that we shouldn't trust scientists because this, it is a very big problem, but there are also countless qualified, well-meaning researchers putting out high quality work that could very well save any of our lives one day. But that also doesn't mean we turn a blind eye to this. If anything, the changes need to be made to help them.